Hello again everyone. In this and the next video we're going to explore the presentation of innocent victims in chapters 6 to 10 of Frankenstein. Today we're going to focus on the character of William and consider his role as an innocent victim in both the typical gothic sense but also examine how his innocence evokes key ideas of the romantic literary movement. The chapters to read in detail before you carry on with this video are 6 and 7, chapters 6 and 7. So William is Frankenstein's younger brother, still in his childhood and looked after by Elizabeth mainly. Elizabeth describes William in a letter to Frankenstein as if he was their child rather than their brother. She says, I must say also a few words to you, my dear cousin, of little darling William. I wish you could see him. He is very tall of his age, with sweet laughing blue eyes, dark eyelashes and curling hair. When he smiles, two little dimples appear on each cheek, which are rosy with health. He has already had one or two little wives, but Louisa Byron is his favourite, a pretty little girl of five years of age. And that's in chapter six, William's first mention. So here William is depicted as the archetypal innocent child, more on which a little later. The next reference to William comes at the start of chapter seven. Victor receives a letter from his father, which is devastating. Alphonse Frankenstein writes, my dear Victor, you have probably waited impatiently for a letter to fix the date of your return to us. And he sort of covers some practicalities. How, Victor, can I relate our misfortune? Absence cannot have rendered you callous to our joys and griefs. It's interesting that Alphonse has to mention that, that he thinks maybe Victor would be callous, ignoring, ignoring uh, the grief of the family. It's strange that he thinks he'd be so distant. Alphonse continues, and how shall I inflict pain on my long absent son? I wish to prepare you for the woeful news, but I know it is impossible. Even now your eye skims over the page to seek the words which are to convey to you the horrible tidings. So he says he's going to cut to the chase, but he does spend an awful long time in this letter foreshadowing the horror to come, because even Alphonse Frankenstein seems to write in a gothic way. And he says, William is dead. That sweet child whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, who was so gentle yet so gay, Victor, he is murdered. That's in chapter seven. That's a pretty short lifespan for William as a character. Shelley introduced him in one chapter with a cursory reference to how jolly and innocent he is. And four pages later, at the start of chapter seven, the second time William's name is mentioned, it's to tell us that he's been murdered. In terms of Shelley's craft as a novelist, we might ask, why bother to introduce this brother for Frankenstein one moment and kill him off the next? without developing much sympathy in the reader for him. William is a two-dimensional narrative device, but he's a very significant one. We're going to look at William's character in three ways. Firstly, we're going to consider him as a structural device. So structurally, his death comes two short chapters after Victor has managed to bring his creature to life. One of Victor's urges in creating the monster was to master life and death. Remember, he said, what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invul invulnerable to any but a violent death? He said that in chapter two. So we're given the sense that part of Victor's desire to master life and death is a sense of having been unable to save his mother from dying. Reading chapter five, we, like Victor, are convinced that he has achieved his goal. Therefore, it might be reasonable to expect that none of his loved ones will ever die again. He has achieved something a bit like the elixir of life through his experiment. William's death, coming so soon after chapter five, is the necessary jolt back to reality in the real world for Victor and for the reader. It was hubristic of Victor, perhaps even hubristic of us, to imagine that he could master death. Here is the proof his powers are mortal and fallible after all. He might have played God, 
but he isn't God. The second thing to consider in terms of William's role as a narrative device. We don't know who or what killed William at this point in the novel, but as a modern reader with a good understanding of Gothic narrative in films and books, we suspect, correctly, that it was Victor's creature. Shelley builds up to the confirmation of this fact in painstaking detail, very, very slowly, over the course of chapters 6, 7, 8 and 9. We seem to realise it at the same speed as Frankenstein, who puts together the evidence and plunges further into his guilt. Shelley may have read some very early examples of detect detective fiction. We don't know. Detective fiction really had its heyday in the later Victorian period, uh, but there were some examples from the 18th century. Either way, there are certain features of William's death which would be at home in some of the great Victorian detective novels like Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. Most chillingly, some of the evidence that points to the creature is Alphonse Frankenstein's description of the corpse. Stretched on the grass, livid and motionless, the print of the murder's, murderer's finger was on his neck. This method of killing becomes something of a calling card for the creature. As a means of murder, it is intriguingly ambiguous. On the one hand, to be able to kill with your bare hands speaks of a supernatural physical strength, which is a classic, horrifying Gothic trope. However, no weapon is used. No blood is drawn. Perhaps, spoiler alert, perhaps like Lenny, in Of Mice and Men, this accidental murder by a character who is so innocently naive they don't know their own strength is an invitation for us to consider who is the guilty party here. And thirdly, let's have a look at the broader symbolism of William's death. Elsewhere in chapters 6 and 7, Shelley symbolically establishes that whoever killed William was truly a monster. How much more a murderer that could destroy such radiant innocence, continues Alphonse Frankenstein's letter. Now, the traditional philosophical debate, labelled as Manichaean dualism, describes how the universe is the product of an ongoing battle between two equal, uh, co-eternal first principles, like big ideas, God and the Prince of Darkness, or even more simply, good and evil. From these first principles follow all good and evil substances which are in constant battle for supremacy. So all good and evil people, for example. Now this is a binary understanding of good and evil. Shelley establishes it at this point in the novel to force her reader to confront a number of moral questions including, are Victor's actions good or evil, or somewhere in the murky grey area between those two poles. This binary understanding of good and evil was, as many of you already know, a key feature of another famous romantic writer's work. William Blake's famous Innocence and Experience poems explore good and evil, naivety and corruption, as if they were binary opposites. The collection that we now know as Songs of Innocence and of, and of Experience were in fact published as two books of poetry. Innocence was published in 1789, uh, then the French Revolution happened and Blake felt that innocent ambitions like liberation and political freedom had been corrupted. And then Experience was published five years later in 1794. Now, that's a brazen simplification, but it will do for our purposes for today to understand the literary context of Shelley's use of this binary of good and evil in the chapters relating to William's death. Now, I've already shown you how William's description resembles the innocent children that festoon the pages of Blake's Songs of Innocence. In writing his collection of poetry, Blake was inspired by the thinking of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose Emile, or On 
on Education, which was written in 1762, not only rejects the idea of original sin, that we're all born uh, innately evil or innately flawed, but it maintains, this book maintains, that children are innately innocent, only becoming corrupted, I suppose, through experience of the world. There is no greater corruption than death, especially in Gothic novels. So William's drastic transition from innocent to corrupted, in the space of one chapter, four pages, demonstrates the truth of what Rousseau was saying, and of what the Romantic writers believed. Shelley includes this strong caricature of Rousseau and Blake's archetypal corrupted innocence to highlight how powerfully corrupting experience of the world can be, not just for children. In chapter 5, we saw how Victor gained experience. The example of the caricature of William reveals how the knowledge, or experience, the two are synonymous, Victor has acquired, will corrupt him too in turn. It foreshadows how he too will die because of his experience of the world. Rousseau and the Romantic writers who followed him also believed that children possessed one of the most powerful human features, characteristics, imagination. They believed that this imagination needed channeling towards good moral outcomes, which should be done through education. Victor's imagination seems to have run riot in his creation of another living human being. Chapters two to four showed us how he turned his back on morally correct scientific education and instead towards turned towards the occult scientists, Agrippa, Paracelsus, etc. Shelley tells us the horror of deaths like Williams are what happens when imagination is corrupted. Finally, it's in this way that the scenes surrounding Williams' death are so powerfully gothic. Yes, innocent victims die in gothic novels. Usually, though, they're female, and I've included a couple of links, uh, particularly one to an interesting article you should read if you want to push your thinking a little further on this and consider the question, why is William not a sister? He could be Wilhelmina, for example. Wouldn't he be even more innocent in that case? In any case, the truly gothic aspects of these scenes come from this theme of the corruption of the imagination. Gothic narratives speak to our imaginations. They encourage us to fantasise and then reveal the dangers of such fantasy. This is what Freud's uncanny is all about. We imagine a monstrous or unsettling version of reality. So Shelley's message to us in these chapters that deal with William's death is this is how damaging corruption of the imagination can be. It can unleash gothic horror. In our next video, we will look at the death of Justine in the chapters that follow William's death. Uh, Shelley stacks them up and uh, hits the reader with both of them in quite quick succession. So that you're ready for that lesson, I want you to think about a comparison between the two deaths. You're going to read Justine's characterization in chapters 7, 8 and 9, and then complete this Venn diagram comparing the two characters in life and in death. Well done, you've made it to the end of the lesson.